everything and we are here to learn and grow together. So we are very grateful for you to be here. Before we get started, um, oh, should we start um, the screen share of the slides? Also, just as a reminder, we're gonna be recording this session so that we can um, share the recording for future participants and we can look back on the recording. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So before we begin, I just wanna share with you our planning team. So um, first on our planning team, we have Lucy from Myron B. Thompson Academy and she's 17 years old. And I'm Clara, I'm 16 and I go to Iolani. And then also in our planning team is Sarah and she goes to UH Manoa and she majors in global env environmental science and she's 21. And then we also have Lauren and she's um, 30 and she's the community organizer for the Sierra Club of Hawaii and she's a UH Manoa alumni. So here's what you can expect from us today. First, we're gonna go over the MS principles and then also our environmental justice framework, which is, um, we're gonna talk about procedural justice. We're gonna um, talk about the difference between community consultation and community consent. And then we're also going to hear from community leaders from Kahuku who are gonna share their work um, and how they're making energy justice a reality for the North Shore. We're very happy to hear from them. And then after that, we're gonna have a breakout session for 15 minutes where we can ask them questions and start thinking about ways where we can fix our broken system to incorporate communities in the decision-making process. And then after that, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna have an optional pauhana for 15 minutes where we can talk about um, the colloquium and then any questions or just comments that have come up. And so now Lucy is going to talk about the Hemis Principles. Yeah, hi, thank you guys for being here today. I'm super excited to be on this journey with you all. Um, before we start, we wanna ground ourselves in these principles to make sure that we're creating an energy justice movement that's rooted in inclusivity and justice. Um, so this is a space for all voices and we really wanna create a place where people feel encouraged and um, safe to share their thoughts and questions we're all coming from different backgrounds with different levels of knowledge. Um, so hopefully we can, we can build and learn from each other today. Next slide. Yeah, so to get us started, our last energy justice colloquium was the framework for what energy justice is. So we will give you a recap of what that is in case you're joining us new this month. Um, so energy justice builds upon environmental justice and climate justice movements, which are rooted in the idea that people have a right to clean air, water, and a dignified life, um, and should not be unequally burdened by climate change, which is something that we see because of the systemic issues that we have in a lot of our um, systems of government. Uh, so in, in energy justice, we expand the concept into the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy to address equity and racial injustices within the current extractive energy system. So we are working to achieve energy justice um, through incorporating aspects of deeper democracy and building energy behind taking power back from corporate profit driven utility models. Um, so there are kind of two pillars of what energy justice is and how to like go through the, like that process, which is distributive and procedural justice. Um, so today we are going to actually highlight procedural justice and talk a little bit more about that to set context for our guest speakers. Um, so procedural justice requires that communities impacted by energy projects and those otherwise marginalized due to the energy system work with policymakers to co-create and co-design a fair process um, to really include people in these energy decisions, which is really important. Um, so a part of ensuring that procedural justice is making sure that there is community consent on the projects that are happening. Next slide. So identifying the difference between consultation and consent is really important. Um, currently, we actually only have consultation, not necessarily consent. So consultation means community hosting a project is approached after contracts, permits, and funding are obtained, um, whereas consent is making sure that that 
um, community is actually consenting and agreeing to that project before just going ahead with it. The law mandates that developer must get formal permission approval in order to obtain contracts and permits. And that's really how we have those community conversations and make sure that our energy pro projects are um, equitable. So a major issue in the energy system is that the communities hosting the projects are not receiving the direct benefit from the energy project. We would like to see more locally sourced energy that is not dependent on large utility scale projects that threaten the environment and host communities well-being. Um, and in the meantime, we have to make pre prior and informed consent on part of the decision making process. Um, and until communities impacted by energy projects are included in the developmental process, we can't each, we can't achieve like a true just transition. I'll let Clara talk a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. So we're really um, grateful to hear from and also to get to speak with community members from Kahuku and their experience and their struggle is a prime example of what can go wrong in the transition to renewable energy. So back in 2019, there were nearly 200 Kia'i who were arrested for trying to stop the construction of Napua Makani turbines. And after this, there was a little bit like a false narrative that um, the community was an obstacle to renewable energy, which is completely unfair when you hear about the process and the actual um, what, what actually happened. And when you look at that, you can see how like civil disobedience and how the process took away all the options for the community members to be involved and to be engaged in this process of implementing renewable energy. And so Napua Makani has um, shown how our transition to renewables can be just as um, susceptible to environmental racism and environmental injustice as dirty energy systems. And so that's why it's so necessary to include and engage the community, the community that's being impacted in these situations when you're in this process. And so we're very excited to listen and learn from Kahuku community members on um, the many years of opposition and what they're doing now to seek energy justice for the North and windward side of Oahu. Is that, is that my cue? All right, <laughs> aloha everyone. I'm Jessica Dos Santos. Um, I'm a, a teacher here in um, a charter school here on Oahu and um, a member of Kahuku community and um, one of the main um, leaders of the movement, what people here um, know as Kukia i Kahuku. And we wanted to start off with um, just making clear some things um, before we move on. Um, you know, we had been in opposition to the Nampu Makani project for 10 years. And all throughout the 10 year process, um, we, you know, our community said no for a variety of different reasons. Um, we went through all the legal processes that we could possibly, you know, participate in, advocate for ourselves in, and, um, you know, including lawsuits, um, you name it. Um, but essentially, we ended up um, really understanding how the system really did not listen to community members or take into account any form of consent on our part. Um, but just to be clear, we are for responsible green and clean energy. So a lot of us um, have been wanting to um, have solar panels on our rooftops and we advocate for um, rooftop solar um, as part of our, you know, just transition. We love to see every rooftop and every parking lot full of solar panels before we begin to look at these large scale industrial um, type of energy projects. Um, and I love how you folks explained it that um, the same sort of structure and mentality that the fossil fuel industry use in their extractive model. It looks as if corporations have now pivoted to using that same mentality and that same structure in the green energy implementation of certain green energy projects. 
um, where tr for true Aloha Aina based solutions, you know, there are a thousand ways that we can combat climate change and clean energy is just one of them. And so um, we advocate for all of those different solutions as well as of course, community involvement in the decision-making process. So um, to get to the point where us law-abiding citizens, right? We're, we're mothers, we're teachers, we, we follow the law. Like, you know, we advocate for people to follow the law. It's there for a reason. But the need for peaceful nonviolent resistance was definitely there in our case. Next slide. Thank you. So um, it's really important to ground ourselves as well as um, in a, a Hawaii version of what we consider environmental justice. And so I'm going to go ahead and read this um, definition. It says environmental justice is the right of every person in Hawaii to live in a clean and healthy environment, to be treated fairly, and to have meaningful involvement in decisions that affect their environment and health, which an emphasis on the responsibility of every person in Hawaii to uphold traditional and customary Native Hawaiian practices that preserve, protect, and restore the aina for present and future generations. Environmental justice in Hawaii recognizes that no one segment of the population or geographic area should be disproportionately burdened with environmental and or health impacts resulting from development, construction, operations, and or use of natural resources. So our story is the exact opposite of everything listed in there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next slide, sorry. So just a little bit of um, demographic background of Kahuku. So according to the 2010 census, you can see that Kahuku is, um, a, you know, we are a small rural town made up of, of a wide variety of beautiful, amazing people um, that you would consider, um, yes, thank you, Lauren, um, that you would consider, um, you know, minorities, um, POC, right? Um, we are, you know, an example of a community that has been disproportionately disadvantaged and overburdened by all of the things that are, you know, bearing down on our community just struggling to survive. Next slide. So this image we found really powerful during our fight and this image actually represents, um, you know, what we mean by overburdened and um, you know disadvantaged. Um, obviously there are, um, we have a lack of resources in our um, area. And one of the biggest lack of resource that we have is the financial resource to really, you know, hire attorneys um, to take off of work, to attend these meetings where supposedly they had asked for community input, things like that. If people are working two or three jobs, they're not able to attend, you know, all of these community meetings and um, the system is actually designed um, <laughs> to, you know, to, they really don't want our voices to be heard. They pretend like they want to hear it, but, um, you know, they provide the meetings, but they don't really truly give us a true opportunity to um, have consultation, let alone consent. Thank you. Next slide. So here's an example of environmental injustice, right? So Kohuku um, not only um, now houses 40% of Oahu's total wind production, keep in mind we are a small 2.3 mile square mile, you know, community, but yet we house 40% of all of our uh, Oahu's wind production. Um, in addition to that, we are um, slated for the top two um, sites for a future landfill on Oahu, right? So um, th thinking um, ahead, the, the turbine blades that cannot be recycled may end up in landfills that are in our backyard as well. Thank you, next slide. 
Um, another um, part of the environmental injustice is the imp economic impacts. And so um, through our research, we found that because of um, the, the installation of these turbines, there is a minimum of $620,000 loss in property value per home in Kahuku, which would mean that um, the addition of the AES turbines um, may possibly result in about $3.58 million loss for all of Kahuku residents in terms of property value. Thank you. Um, and so these turbines are, um, if, you, if you are unaware, um, the largest land turbines in the United States. Um, they are larger than the tallest building in the state of Hawaii and much, much larger um, you know, than the current 12 turbines that we already have. So 20 too many is not fair, right? So we already had 12 and, and then they surrounded us with another eight. Thank you. And in addition to that, um, to add insult to injury, Kahuku is also slated to be um, one of the chosen sites for an upcoming uh, military radar um, that would possibly use up almost all of the energy that the Napua Makani turbines are purported to produce. So the community is also against this radar project. And so it just goes to show you that environmental injustice happens in these small rural communities and we're just in being inundated right now. So here are some striking images. Um, the image on the left, if you look to the bottom, there's a red circle. That is actually someone's home. Mm -hmm. And so, so we found out um, that um, the state had granted two illegal exemptions for these turbines to be um, placed closer to um, a residential units. Um, against the law, basically. Um, that's my son's elementary school. So we, I might, I personally live across from the street from Kahuku District Park and the Kahuku Elementary School. And this is an old picture um, of when the turbines were just going up. And so it gives you kind of an idea of how extraordinarily close these turbines are to our school um, and to our schools and residences. Um, and there are a lot of unresolved legal issues. So the, again, the city and county, oh, sorry, the city and county granted AES the illegal waivers to construct the turbines closer than legally allowed. Um, HECO's power purchase agreement um, also, you know, violated various um, agree parts of the agreement. And, um, you know, our attorneys did take that to um, the PUC in a contested case. Um, because there were a lot of just loopholes that were just jumped through illegally and they granted these approvals. Um, for example, the Public Utilities Commission approved the power purchase agreement before the environmental impact statement was completed. And that's just, you don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> um, explosives were, um, were uh, used in three separate occasions and technically the, those ex the use of explosives there were illegal and keep in mind that EV kupuna might um, are you know present in our hills here and so those explosives could have could have been destroying um, ancestors EV um, and unfortunately the state is not able to hold um, the corporation accountable for after the fact. In addition, um, Dr. Ka'ili will explain more about the Habitat Conservation Plan and how um, uh, that is extraordinarily, um, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not going to help the sacred ope'ope'a. It's not proven, their plan is not even proven to protect our endangered species. Um, in addition, we were worried about our historic site, sites, such as the um, some bridges, Palmalu Bridge, we were worried that um, it could collapse. And uh, as you see with the recent flooding, um, 
one of the bridges in Haula did in fact collapse due to the flooding. And so we're, we had this very legitimate concern that our bridge on Komehameha Highway could collapse. Next slide. All right, and so yes, um, throughout the struggle, and I and I would actually love to turn it to um, Dr. Kaili at this time um, to talk more about um, the the community solidarity that that was built between um, the Mauna Kea folks and the Waianae folks, um, as well as community support that we received from our local neighborhood boards. Um, but essentially, I I'm going to end my portion by saying that we need this systemic change. Um, if we are going to move forward to th through a just um, energy transition, we really do need to listen to the voices of the people. I'm gonna add, insert this in, for example, right now there's actually um, a rally being held um, by Native Hawaiians who are um, protesting the use of a solar farm on Hawaiian homestead land. These are lands that should be used for providing homes for the native Hawaiian people of this place, as well as for their farming purposes. And the state is just allowing large corporations to put solar panels on these lands that should be designated for homes for the people. So there are things going on that we're um, connected to and involved with. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Kaili at this time. And I'm going to go ahead and. Um, I'm going to share here my, my screen, um, okay, Jessica. So thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And aloha, everyone. Good to, to see all of you here. Uh, it's wonderful to be, um, you know, be part of this uh, colloquium and to see all the wonderful work that you're all doing in, in, in here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share just, I only have a few slides that just to kind of support what Jessica uh, has been talking about. Um, first, I want to just to add uh, my thoughts on the idea of, you know, meaningful involvement of all people. You know, one of the, the main idea is uh, called FPIC, free prior and informed consent, uh, free from sort of kind of manipulating people or trying to give people money so that they can vote in certain ways. And so, you know, that, was not uh, taken into consideration here in Kahuku. And, uh, you know, we really wish that that was the case. Uh, prior, uh, there were some prior uh, involvement of many of us, but uh, it wasn't uh, given us enough time for us to be able to think through and be able to decide. And then of course, inform and, and the last part consent. And I like your distinction between consultation and consent because uh, we didn't have the ability to say no um, it was more like we've we've gone through all the process and we just want to let you know that this is what's happening. So I think that's sort of kind of important element to just to add to this. Uh, so uh, Jessica was talking about our next area that we we're trying to fight and we're, we are calling it the toxic industrial military radar complex, sort of name that I, uh, Jessica and I sort of kind of came up with because it, there's a lot of concern about the, the way that this uh, military radar is going to be built here in Kahuku with the uh, issue relating to fuel, uh, you know, and things that will be, it's up on the hill. And then it's just the last big rain that we had, all the water that was coming down. This is all the, the you know, the toxic waste that will be coming down from, from this all the way down to where we're, we're living in Kahuku. Now, this is just a, a picture. I wanted to show you a picture of how much destruction to the land took place in order to build the turbines. This is, you know, if you can see this mount here, this mount here was totally flattened. Dynamites were used in order to be able to build these turbines. So one of the major environmental impact of this that a lot of people never talked about, or maybe we haven't really talked about is this sort of the major impact uh, of you know, a, a construction of these uh, turbines on, on, on our land. Uh, of course, the Opeapea is a very important element of, of uh, culturally and ecologically significant to Hawaiian culture. And so, you know, it was our kuleana as a kia'i to protect this and because they are the, the, the you know, the, the wind creature that are majorly impacted by the wind turbines. And so in our early fight, this was what we were using as part of our fight in the beginning. We went so far as trying to get as much support as we can. You can see here, we were trying to use Batman symbol 
and use it in a t-shirt in order for us to appeal to more people. And we were, and this was like back in 2017, you can see here, we had a DLNR contested hearing on habitat conservation plan, which is basically, we were telling the DLNR that the habitat conservation plan, which is a plan to mitigate or minimize the damage or the killing of the Opeapea, um, basically we were telling them that it wasn't effective and that there was no evidence at this hearing at the DLNR, we actually won our case and the hearing officer said that we were, we were right, but then the board, the Board of Land and Natural Resources uh, overruled the, the hearing officer and went the other way and said, go ahead and build the, the boom. So this case is now in the Hawaii Supreme Court on April 1st, we're going, this is how many years we've been fighting on, on this issue. Now, I wanna just give, give you a picture of some of the police officers who came to some of the, the time that we were, you know, blocking the road and get arrested. We, you know, we, we would have uh, somewhere around 200 police officers. This is just a picture of them. Uh, this was in Kahuku and one of the nice, uh, the, I think this is the first day uh, or one of the first day when we were blocking the, the, the roads. You can see the presence of, of police officers. Um, you know, how many police officers does it take to uh, arrest a kupuna? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, so many of them. So just to kind of give you a picture of, you know, just the, the, the what, how this went. Um, here's a picture of some of the people. If any of you came to Kalailoa, you would see uh, what people were doing as far as this is how far we were going to go to protect the aina, to protect our environment from the, the, the turbines. Uh, we, we connected so much with the people from YNI and um, Nanakuli, you can see uh, Kauka here is one of the leaders from um, YNI who came and you can see he became, we became very close throughout the whole, you know, 39 days of our stance with them. Other people from different groups, you can see Kumuhina here, who's not a member of our community or a member of, of, of YNI, but came almost every night. We had people from different cultures, you know, you can see Tongan flag, Hawaiian flags, they were all involved in this, uh, in this event. So, I want to just sort of kind of share some of those uh, images with you because I think it's important just to kind of get a sense um, to, to add to what Jessica was saying as far as some of these particular issues. So I'm happy to have some, you know, later on if you have questions about us and, and so forth. So. Thank you so much to the both of you for sharing um, and for like explaining all of the different ways that um, these wind turbines are impacting your community. And so now our next steps are to like continue to um, just hear from you and then also to support. And so ways that we can support the Kahuku community is by tuning in and clicking on this YouTube link that leads to the um, court case hearing that you can show the Supreme Court that people are coming and the people are viewing it and we're in support of the Kahuku community. And then um, also to look at some other links, there's the one that Lauren put in the chat about Enough Turbine Hawaii, so you can um, read further about um, this case. And then also there's another link that's gonna be in there. That's like a blog post um, related to the court case hearing that's coming up on April 1st. And now, um, Lucy will talk about our next um, part of the agenda. Yeah, thank you guys. I think that was super helpful to really contextualizing, you know, the issues that are going on and the lack of um, environmental justice. So now we're actually going to go into a breakout room and we're going to be using Padlet. So I'm going to share my screen um, just to show you guys a little bit of what Padlet is in case some of you have never used it before. So these are going to be our two questions today. What questions do you have for the guest speakers and what ideas do you have to create a better system for community collaboration on energy projects? And to contribute, we're going to be having a verbal conversation, but we want to keep track of some of the thoughts and ideas. Um, so it's going to generate this. You kind of have to go to the top, which is a little annoying, but then you can type your idea. It'll sit there and then you can connect it to the question that you're responding to. And I'll put this link in the chat. Um, and if you guys can open this up, if you have the ability to, that would be super awesome.
And if we can go into the breakout rooms and if you guys can turn on your cameras so that we can really have a meaningful discussion, that would be awesome.